up every morning and prepare yourself for another day of the same old routine, the same old rut. You eat your breakfast, brush your teeth, throw on some clothes and head out the door to get to work. As you wait anticipating your day, a nagging thought takes you away from your to-do list. The same question enters your mind, one you've always fought with. What's the meaning of my life? Sure, there are obvious short-term goals. Get through college, buy a nice car, get married, have some kids, build your retirement fund, and then you die. So what's the point? Are all our lives just a cycle of short-term accomplishments? Is there really no hope? Is there lasting meaning? Something beyond ourselves that will live on in us? Even after we're gone? Well, it seems like there should be. We all yearn for something deeper, something significant. But that's not really proof that something really is. What about light? If there was never light, obviously we wouldn't know what light was. Know what dark was without light? Dark would be meaningless without light. Maybe life's meaning is the same way. If life didn't have meaning, would we ever have looked for meaning in it? We have to feel a void so that we'll search for an answer. Life has meaning and hope. I guess I just need to seek it. So this is the fourth and final installment of the You Asked For It series. And since we started that series with a question from Chris Dizel, it only seems appropriate to bookend the series with another one of his suggestions. Actually, he just suggested an Old Testament passage, pa uh, passage. You can blame me for framing the question. The question is simple. Life is meaningless. It's dust to dust. What's the point? Bob Dylan, considered one of the greatest pop songwriters of all time, wrote a song in 1965 called Like a Rolling Stone. It has been labeled as perhaps the greatest rock lyric ever to have been written. In fact, Rolling Stone did a, a 500 greatest songs of all time in 2004 and then again in 2010, and it was still the number one song both times. So nothing had surpassed it in that 10-year period. The chorus of the song goes like this. How does it feel to be on your own, with no direction home, a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? Bob Dylan's song speaks to the common experience of loneliness and isolation, made more acute today by our technology and our modern culture in large cities. 
But Dylan is not alone in this perspective. A guy named Hugh Moorhead, about 50 years ago, began writing to famous philosophers and scientists and authors and saying to them, what is the purpose of life? The responses he got from them are to be kind, depressing. Isaac Asimov, the greatest sci-fi writer of all time, wrote back, as far as I can see, there is no purpose to life. Carl Jung, the Austrian psychiatrist, wrote, I don't know what the meaning of the purpose of life is, though it looks as if there were supposed to be something meant by it. Arthur Clarke, the, uh, another award-winning sci-fi author, wrote, I'm afraid I have no concrete ideas on the purpose of life. Albert Ellis, a psychiatrist um, who invented the RET therapy, said, as far as I can tell, life has no special or intrinsic meaning or purpose. Gerald Frank, writer and pioneer of the as-told-to method of reporting, says, in the cosmic scheme, I can see neither meaning nor purpose. Thomas Nagel, an award-winning philosopher, said, I'm afraid the meaning of life eludes me. And Joseph Heller, widely respected author, with a clear sense of resignation, says, I have no answers to the question of the meaning of life, and I no longer want to search for any. That's sad. That's terribly sad. But you know what? It, they're not alone. Most research indicates that 50% of Americans suffer from clinical depression to a greater or lesser degree. As I noted a few weeks ago, suicide rates across all demographics have, have continued to rise over the last 25 years. One study says that the number of people who believe that life has no meaning numbers more than 70 million in the United States. That's basically one out of five. Look at the four people around you, and if you think they think life has meaning, then you're the one that doesn't. So we say to ourselves, we ask ourselves, is it true? Is life meaningless? Is there a purpose to life? Is there a meaning to life? And if there is, can we know it? That is the question that Solomon asks in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, we all know Solomon prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, I will give you anything that you want. Riches, immortality, anything that you want. And Solomon said, just give me wisdom. And God did. And so Solomon is widely regarded as the wisest human being to ever live. What you may not know, he's also the third most prolific writer in the Old Testament behind Moses and David. He is generally accepted as the author of all or major parts of three books, the Song of Songs, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Some scholars postulate that he wrote the Song of Songs when he was a young man, that he wrote Proverbs, which is an accumulation of his wisdom and the wisdom of some others in his uh, general purview. I did that during his midlife, and then he wrote Ecclesiastes as he was entering AARP territory. Simply put, reading those books in order gives you a certain perspective to Solomon's life. He went from being passionate to pragmatic to pessimistic, or so it would seem. Listen and look at these words from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Oops, I thought I put them up there. I did not. I'm sorry, my bad. I'll just read them to you. How's that? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 18 to 22. He says this. He says, I decided that God leaves it the way it is to test people and to show them that they are just like animals. The same thing happens to animals and to people. They both have the same breath, so they both die. People are no better off than the animals because everything is useless. Both end up the same way. Both come from dust and both will go back to dust. Who can be sure that the human spirit goes up to God and that the spirit of an animal goes down into the ground? So I saw that the best thing people can do is enjoy their work because that's all they have. No one can help another person see what will happen in the future. Well, that sounds pretty depressing too, doesn't it? Live for today because tomorrow is unknown. You're no better off than an animal. It's going to live and die. You're going to live and die. 
So eat, drink, and be merry because, right? I am really glad Solomon didn't stop writing at the end of chapter 3. By the way, we understand chapter and verse is a modern um, a tool, mechanical tool that was devised in order to be able to help us to find certain passages of Scripture. So Solomon kept on writing. And what he did was to continue to write things that he thought would help us. He wanted for us to ponder all of this as truth. Now, there's that troublesome word again that I mentioned a few weeks ago. Solomon intends to tell us in this book the truth about life. In his wisdom, if you continue reading the book, you discover that even in his moments of greatest despair, he arrived at some sound conclusions about life and meaning. For example, Solomon freely admits, evil is real, and worse, it's permanent. It ain't going anywhere. It has existed since the fall, and it will continue to exist until God comes and sets things right and anew. And because evil is real and permanent, injustice and oppression will exist in the world, and, or do exist in the world, and will always exist because the evil is permanent. And he says, it affects some people because they fill their heads with folly, and so foolish people continue to make foolish decisions. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure in the last 3,000 years, none of that's changed. Everything that he said was just as true today as it was then. So is there an answer to this question, what's the point? Thankfully, Solomon has an answer to the question, which I think he knew from the moment he began to write. After all, wisest human being, right? But he wants to lay the foundation before he builds a house. He recognizes that there's a need to set a tone, to lay the groundwork, to, to build the foundation so that he can offer real truth. And here it is. Despite the fact that evil is real, that injustice and oppression exist, and that folly rules the lives of far too many people, Solomon says, even in the midst of it, God is here, God is there, God knows, and God cares. That's the point. In fact, it's the only point that matters. Solomon acknowledges that we as human beings can do little to eliminate all evil. We can only marginally address injustices, and oppression. Now that should never prevent us from trying, but we should not become discouraged when we do not succeed at it at the levels we desire to succeed at it. Our best efforts may fail, but God never will. So let me share what I think are some of the truths that we can glean from all of Ecclesiastes regarding God and meaning and life. First, life isn't meaningless if God is in it. A lot of times we like to look at the Old Testament story about Job. It's a story of someone who also was facing despair in, the, in life and believing that life had no meaning. Job lost his sons and daughters, though God spared his wife. I have no idea why. If you read, well, if you read the story, his wife is the one that says, you should curse God and die. I think the story of Job is what inspired the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, to say, uh, better to live in the corner of an attic than to dwell with a nagging woman. That's scripture, folks. Don't get on my gaze. Anyway, so Job lost his, his sons and daughters. He lost his possessions. He lost his, his, his flocks and his herds. And he even lost his good health. And his friends come and try to console him. Some of them try to chastise him. Some of them just sit to face the struggle with him, but ultimately, it all comes to no avail. Finally, it is God himself who speaks to Job and tells him what he needs to hear. He says to Job, where were you when I made everything? Where were you when I made your world? Do you understand how the seasons work? Do you understand how animals interact? 
Did you give the wings to the eagles? Did you give strength to the horse? Over and over again, God says to Job, Show me your great wisdom, O Job. And in a moment of full self-realization, Job goes, Oops, my bad. What he actually says is, God, I know you can do all things and that you have no plan, and that no plan of yours that you have can be ruined. Job realizes that God has a purpose and a plan for everything he does, even if Job couldn't see it, couldn't understand it, couldn't grasp it, didn't like it. What that tells me and what that story, I think, is intended for us to understand is that there is purpose and meaning to our life, even though we may not recognize what it is at the moment. Solomon is advocating for the idea that God has an appointed and appropriate time for everything. A time to plant and a time to, to harvest. Just read that, that section in chapter 3. talked about that um, Wednesday night. And God's plans, he says, are all sufficient. And they are so amazing as to create within man When we see it and see it come together, there is this sense of awe and reverence, not just for what God has done, but how and when he did it. Let me give you an illustration from my own life. Most of you um, who have been here for my whole career know that prior to ministry, I had somewhat of a successful career in the insurance business. I went into the insurance business not knowing anything about it. I mean, I didn't even know what it was to have insurance or pay for insurance. And I went in to interview, the first interview I ever had with the first company I ever had with this manager who was interviewing me for this position. And I did something that impressed him and caused him to offer me the job on the spot. What was it you say? Well, when I was in college, I'd applied for a position working as a car jockey for a local dealership there. I would take the cars to get them washed, and I would take them from one dealership to the other. And one day I was talking to one of the salesmen who told me his trick to get prospective buyers to sign the contract. He would say, when the contract was done, he would go, I need you to just put your John Hancock right there on the bottom line. And he would hold the pen out like this. He wouldn't lay it down. If you lay it down, everybody just stares at it. He held it out. And what's the natural reaction when somebody hands something out to you? You grab it. You take it. I thought, that's a pretty cool trick. So when I did the interview with with, uh, this insurance company, I employed that trick. And I got that job on the spot. See, I believe God knew the appropriate time and place that I would need to know this information, that I would need to know that trick, even though I did not know when it was going to be. He had a purpose for my working at that dealership. I wasn't in car sales. I was doing grunt work. But he had a purpose for me talking to that salesman that day, who I didn't really know all that well, and I really didn't care about buying and selling cars. He had a purpose for me interviewing with that company and that manager on that moment. If I had interviewed with another company, another manager, they might not have been impressed with this trick at all. Solomon says that after having studied life and everything in it, he has discovered that God has a plan and a purpose for everything that happens. Life lived, in Solomon's words, under the sun, that is, life that is accomplished by one's own power, he says that's utterly meaningless. But life lived under heaven, where it's accomplished in God's timing and purposes and planning, that has meaning and hope. God was and still is in every part of my life, and I praise in every part of yours. I know he is if you have surrendered to him. For the Christian, the follower of Jesus, nothing is accidental. Nothing is coincidental. 
God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and only you can accomplish that plan. Only you can do what God designed you to do, and you will do it better than anybody else could ever do it. You simply trust him and follow wherever he leads. Secondly, life isn't hopeless since God is in it. If the Bible says anything, it says repeatedly that God is the source of our hope. He is not just the source of it. He is our eternal hope, Scripture says. Abraham hoped in God. And Scripture says he became the father of many nations. David hoped in God, and Scripture says he slew the giant Goliath. Jonah hoped in God and was delivered after he repented from the mount and the belly of the whale. Gideon hoped in God. And the armies of Israel won some of their greatest battles under the leadership of of one who initially said he was the least of the least of the least. Paul says over and over again, Christ is our hope for eternity. He is our hope for salvation. He is hope for our strength, hope for our resurrection, and the hope for our new birth. Yes, when you read Ecclesiastes, it sounds as though Solomon has no hope. When you read what Job says to his friends, he speaks as one who seems to have no hope. And admittedly, it is true from time to time, all of our lives seem hopeless. We seem helpless. We feel useless. And that is when we need to be reminded, God is still with us. God is still in us. And as the writer to the Hebrew says, our hope in Christ is the anchor firm and secure for our souls. Do not let the enemy or anyone else ever convince you that you have no hope, that you have no help, that there is nothing to look forward to tomorrow. When you have Christ, not if, but when you have Christ, you have hope. Because nothing is impossible for God to do. Whatever circumstances you face, whatever trials you are going through, whatever hopeless surroundings you feel are around you. It's a song we said this morning, says, we are surrounded by his love. Therefore, we have hope. And when you have Christ, you not only have hope, you have help. And when you have Christ, you have all and everything you need to face whatever tomorrow will bring us. Great old song that we used to sing. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Hold to that hand this morning. Thirdly, life is endless, with or without God in it. Solomon is pretty clear about this too. Chapter 11, verse 9 says, Be happy, young man, while you are young, but know this, God will bring you to judgment. One of the realities of life is judgment. Paul reminds the Corinthians, he says, One day, every soul who has ever lived will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The truth is, this physical existence is not all there is to life. True, we have a physical life which will one day end. Indeed, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, as Solomon says. But the reality is, we are more than physical beings. We are created in God's eternal image, in the Imago Dei, as we call it in theology. We have an eternal soul that will live on after our, God willing, 90 to 100 years of life. That means we have to consider the eternal when we're contemplating the temporal. 
when Jewish psychiatrist Viktor Frankl was arrested by the Nazis in World War II, he was put in Auschwitz, the, the infamous German death camp. They stripped him at that time of everything he had, his property, his possessions, and, and a manuscript that he had spent years writing and researching on finding the meaning of life. He had sewn the manuscript into the lining of his coat, so when he had to surrender his coat, he could not acknowledge that that was in there. But he writes, he says, Now it seemed to me as if nothing and no one would survive me, not a physical nor spiritual child of my own. I found myself confronted with the question of whether under such circumstances my life would now be ultimately void of any meaning. A few days later, the Nazis came in and ordered the prisoners to give up what little clothing they still had that belonged to them. Frankel writes, I had to surrender my remaining clothes and in turn inherited the worn-out rags of an inmate who had been sent to the gas chamber. I had already lost the many pages of my manuscript and what few notes I had created since being in camp were now gone. However, he says, I found in the pocket of the newly acquired coat a single page torn out of a Hebrew prayer book. It contained the Jewish prayer, Shema Israel, which is here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Frankel writes, How should I have interpreted such a coincidence other than this? I am challenged to live my thoughts instead of merely putting them on paper. Frankel later reflected in, on his ordeal in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, saying, there is nothing in the world that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is meaning in one's life. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And we who are believers in Jesus Christ have the greatest why to live for that has ever been known to man. Because of Christ who died for us, we can have the forgiveness of sins through grace by faith. Because of Christ who died for us, we have a hope of an eternal home with Him. Because of Christ who died for us, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit to help us and guide us every single day to find the meaning and purpose of our lives. And we are called and commissioned by that same Christ to share that same simple message with everyone else who needs to hear it. We can believe that God has a plan and a purpose for us and for them as we travel this world headed for the next. Solomon points out that God has a balance to this plan. Birth, death, sorrow, joy, meeting, parting, etc., etc. Solomon says God does all that for two reasons. First, so that we will not think that we can explain, easily explain how God works. We, we can't explain how all those things happen we have some better understanding than Solomon had. But we don't have full understanding. Every day we're finding out more and more of what we don't know. And second, so that we will learn to accept and enjoy what we have. Proverbs 16 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. The Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The answer to the question, what's the point, is to realize that God's timing is perfect and we are to celebrate it. Remember what Paul tells the, the, the church in, in Galatia? In Galatians 4.4, 4, he says, When the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. But God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And he tells the church in Rome, he says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
If you think life is meaningless, let me point you this morning in the direction of the one who gives life meaning. If you think life is hopeless, let me point you in the direction of the one who is hope for today and for tomorrow. If your trust in God has been faltering or you've never sought his plan and purpose for your life, here are the words of Hosea chapter 10. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness upon you. What's the point? Very simple. Trust in God. Follow Him. Rely on Him. And He will direct your life.